All right. Well, Gene Shepard time. It's 5.15. And uh, today, we're going back to those uh, lovely, clear FM broadcasts from 1966. March 9th, specifically, this particular episode. March 9th, 1966. We're going junkin' with Gene. That's right. We're going to go buy some car parts. And fix up that old heap in the driveway. It's coming. I swear to God, it's coming. Gene Shepard here on Mass Backwards. Oh, it's all right. It's okay. This is a very unofficial show. Uh, for those of you out there who are wondering just uh, what is about to occur, I'm going to give you a little, a few of the ground rules. We are breaking in a new engineer tonight, and that's worse than breaking in a new pair of shoes. Bring it up there. They get awful squeaky. Very tight. Okay. That's right. <laughs> You're all the way now. They expect every last drop of this crummy mediocrity. Every last drop. This is absolutely the worst piece of music ever written by the foul mind of man. Bring it up there. Oh. That's precisely why I picked it. Quality of masochism is not strained. Ow! Just burnt my thumb. It's okay. If you uh, care to, uh, if you care to experiment out there, I'm coming to you uh, also uh, in color. Uh, in, in addition to that, you can hear me on FM. It comes through very clear. You can hear the snorts and the wheezes. I'm forever blowing bubbles. Excuse me. While I light my pipe, do you mind if I light my pipe here? This is the mystery sound there. Reminds me of W.C. Fields. His props don't work. The whole thing. I'm just well about Harry. Uh, tonight we're going to do a very special thing here. Uh, we are saluting as part of the vast public service programming of this radio station. Well, you've got to keep your eye on me, Cornell. Now, now watch me carefully, ma'am. See, already? See, you're watching that guy. He's not doing the show. I'm doing the show. He's very loud, but I'm more important here. Uh, at this time, anyway. Uh, let's see, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh yes, uh, oh, oh, we are saluting tonight as a special public service, uh, of, uh, this radio station. We are saluting tonight the indomitable spirit of man. That little spark of pizzazz that all of us possess and that most of us throughout most of our lives attempt to suppress. That indomitable spirit of man. Let's put it this way. What was that famous how many of you, I'm going to go over to the brass piggy with bronze oak leaf palms to any of you. How many of you remember the famous phrase that, uh, Harry Truman, the, uh, the uh, ex-president of the United States, that famous phrase that Harry Truman applied to a music critic who <laughs> wrote a criticism of a performance, and I say that in quotes, of Harry Truman's daughter, who at that time was part of showbiz, or at least she wanted to be part of showbiz. How many of you remember the phrase that Harry Truman used? It consists of three letters. And I will give you a clue. Uh, the first letter is an S. I'll give you another clue, if, if it's still eluding you. The last letter of phrase is a B. You got it now? Well, what we're saluting tonight is the indomitable spirit of that, uh... Okay? Bring it up there. Bring it up there. Fast Matthias. Very good. Cha, 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 cha. This calls for a little, uh, kazoo playing. <laughs> No, no, 
reset that because we're going to be using that. Now, the reason I salute this uh, indomitable spirit, I have here two little news notes, which I am going to use as the basis for tonight's sermon. We are quoting here from the United Press International, and it comes from Chicago. I'll have to use my Chicago. No, I better not use my Chicago accent. There's a lot of very sensitive people out there. And I myself, having festered for a while on the south side of Chicago, having stood at the, on Halston Street at high noon, having walked along Michigan Boulevard with the wind screaming off the lake on more than an occasional moment, having moseyed along Randolph Street in the days of high distress, having been totally out of work in Chicago on more times than I would care to discuss, I know this city almost backwards and forwards. And uh, this is a typical Chicago move. Clad in his undershorts and brandishing three butcher knives, the judge dashed into the night to rescue a lady. Dusted circuit judge Joseph Butler lived up to his own dictum that, quote, in a big city, you have to be your brother's keeper. The judge is 56 years old and recently recovered from a heart attack. But he showed himself to be a dynamic man of action Thursday when a woman was attacked outside his west side home. Butler was preparing for bed when he heard his daughter shout from her bedroom, Leave that woman alone! Very good now. Yeah, I hear, want to hear what, what happened immediately upon that scream coming out of her bedroom. The judge ran to the window and he saw a man with a knife dragging a woman by the hair across his front lawn. <laughs> I used words I never used before. I'm quoting the judge here. I used words I never used before, like you dirty blank, get off my lawn, Judge Butler said. He ordered his daughter to get a golf club. Get my golf club, dear. Quote, I thought a number six iron would be about right. <laughs> but she came back with three butcher knives instead. So armed and stopping only to call the police and throw a raincoat over his shorts and his bare torso, the judge ran to the attack. You see that old cat going out there with them three butcher knives? Uh, wishing instead that he had a number six iron? At first, I couldn't find him. He was in the bushes, Butler said. But just then, I heard the woman yell again, leave me alone. I ran over to the next driveway and yelled so loudly that I woke up the entire neighborhood. And you know, he took one look at me with my three butcher knives and he ran. Just then, several police squad cars showed up. They came running out of their cars hollering, Hey, Judge, which way did he go? They ran where I pointed. Within minutes, police captured a man identified as Robert Lee Steele, 20. All he could say was, Who was that nut? Oh, Judge, we salute you tonight. It ain't easy to be a guy running around on the lawn in the middle of a Chicago winter wearing nothing but a raincoat wishing you had a number six iron. That's enough there. That's very good. Reset that, please. Got old judge out there with an old cat, man. I still like that line where he says, I thought a number six iron would be just about right. <laughs> now, there is that. Now, I, now, I, that is... Now, the reason I read this piece in, in, in that specific way, that is a typical example of Midwestern Chicago-type humor. Now, that's not New York humor. A New York judge would not say that. H have you noticed how little humor there is in the New York political scene? Very little humor. You don't... I'll tell you, you the, the pure light of the dedicated reformer shows out of, say, Lindsay. You don't hear Lindsay ever say. You'd never imagine Lindsay saying, uh, I thought a number six iron would be about right for him. <laughs> it, it, it's a sense of humor. That's all I can say. It's a sense of humor. And now, that kind of humor is the kind of humor out of which people like uh, 
Oh, George Ade came. You know, he was a great... Uh, ben Hecht is an example of that. You know, Hecht came out of Chicago. Uh, Carl Sandberg. You see a little of that running through Sandberg's work. Uh, you see a, a great deal of it running through people. Yeah, Hemingway. What do you think of you know, Hemingway? You don't think that Hemingway is, a, is from, uh, is from uh, Boston, do you? You don't think Hemingway comes from Darien? Oh, no. Oak Park, Illinois. And that, it, that runs right through. I can remember, I can remember innumerable comments. This is a typical comment. Like, like, uh, I'll never forget the time my Uncle Carl had an Essex. And, uh, it rained on it all the time. You know that, that look, this typical American look is the car in the backyard where there's no garage. And if there is a garage, it's being used for old bicycle tires and junk all piled up to the ceiling. And the car is out in the back yet. Typical mid I will sketch for you a Midwestern scene, see? And the rain has been coming down for years and years on this car. Practically all the paint is now washed off of it. If it ever had any paint, it's about 27 hands old. There's been innumerable people have lived and died and swung and hit each other in the head with beer bottles. Who knows what in this car? <laughs> you know, whenever you buy a used car, do you ever have the, the funny feeling? How many of you ever really bought a used car and then after you have it for about three or four months, you find something under the seat? You find, you know, you just something there that, that gives you a clue. It doesn't have to be obscene or anything, just something. And it gives you a clue about a fantastic former history that this car has lived through. Oh, sure, we don't really ever own anything in this world, let's face it. There's nothing. We're just rented. I'm you, we're all rented people. We're all Hertz people. You ever have the vague feeling that you're here on a very brief, you're on a loan out? And nobody quite knows your, your detached service. They had a great line in the army like that. He used to call it, uh, TD. Only, I guess this is why some of the greatest literature has been written about the army, the war, you know, the wars, that kind of thing. Homer, the Homeric epics, the, uh, uh Caesar and his wars, uh, the, the, uh, the Roman Empire, all, all, almost, most of the great literature has somehow touched on this subject. Because in things like the army, in things like wars, things become very plain that are never spoken, you know. Things become very obvious. For example, TD. They don't have much like that in civilian life. You know what TD stands for? Temporary duty. TD. And you find yourself on TD, assigned to an outfit, and forever you're a leper. TD. No stripes, nothing. You're just there temporary. I've known guys that were temporary duty guys for 27 years in the same outfit. They never made him part of the scene. He's TD. Well, now, we're all TD in one way or another. But that beautiful Midwestern scene, I could see that car sitting out there. If you want to, I will sketch now for you a Midwestern landscape. Fences around the backyards. Uh, sort of run-down fences, see. And you can see little stubbles sticking up out of the leftover snow from leftover winters, little stubbles of ancient iris plants that have somehow belonged to some other former tenant who lived in this apartment where you're living in, in this little house, this this St. Louis house. You ever heard of a St. Louis house? Well, they've got St. Louis houses in Chicago. St. Louis house is kind of a, uh, oh, it's kind of a half-baked duplex. There's two houses, one on top of the other, and people in former days, ancient ages past, have, have planted flower beds, which have now since been ground into the dirt and the rubble and the crud of 18 million kids playing backyard basketball. As a matter of fact, backyard basketball is something you don't see much here in the East. But there is not a single backyard worthy of the name in at least seven states that I know of in the Midwest that does not have some kind of a basket nailed on the garage, Nailed on a tree. We had one hanging on a tree in the backyard. Let me tell you, I work, I've never talked about this side of my, of kid life. Is the, is the magnetic hook shot. <laughs> Every kid, we, the first thing we did, I'd go through the backyard on my way home from school. And the first thing I would do, immediately, I'm going through the backyard and I've got a piece of paper, I make a hook shot. Just roll up a piece of paper, hook shot. Off the, off the bonding board. Around the basket. Now, what what kind of a basket was it? Well, it was a basket one time that I bought at Montgomery Ward's. 
I saved for about 27 years at least, it seemed like, to buy this basket. It was a green basket. You know, the hoop, very green thing. It had a green thing on the back, the, the, uh, the backing of the basket. Uh, and it had the, it had white strings. The strings were all, long since gone. They came off in the rain and the crud and the snow and the wind. And it was, it was attached to a tree. And this tree was, uh, how many of you have lived with a, with a backyard that has an old tree in it that no longer is a tree? It's just a lot of things sticking out and a few little leaves and, uh, you hook, uh, clotheslines to it and you put baskets on it and that. And we, we had made, my, my kid brother, myself and Bruner had made this bounding, this backboard. You know rebound board out of a lot of wood and there it was sitting up there year after year year after year and that thing you hear that thing shepherd cans another one <laughs> cans another every time i look at you know I, really i can't help it every time i look at the television shows or i watch a pro basketball game on tv and i see wilt the stilt go up in the air you know and just <laughs> I, I I hear that sound that that goes through your mind when you do that. Shepherd cans another one. Yes, sir. That that great sense, that feeling. You know, you know it's going in. You know that feeling that that you play basketball. You know that great feeling when you let one go and you know it's going to hit. That, that there's a great sense of satisfaction in your gut. You sort of turn away. You don't even watch it. You hear it go goo 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 goo. You know around the around the rim goo goo shoo. Either that or you come dribbling down. One of the greatest sights of all. That one of the great feelings, the, the totally un, un, uh, unrecorded feelings, I've never seen anybody write about the, you know, the, it, being a human being, we have millions of little pleasures, little victories in our lives that are never written about as victories and pleasures. Like waiting for a bus and the bus comes. That's a great feeling, you know, <laughs> the bus is there, you get in, you know, you've waited and waited. Well, one of the great unrecorded feelings, and it's almost exclusively a male feeling, although I'm sure that there are, you know, there are a lot of girls that have played basketball, but it's a male feeling. You're in the gym, and it's a gym class, you know, and, and you've divided up, you're playing basketball. You know how you always did that, to play basketball? And you come dribbling along, and uh, you're, you're playing backcourt, right? and, and the hot shots are up ahead of you, Joshua and a couple other guys, you know, the, the forwards are going down, and you come dribbling along, now you're at center court, see? You pass over to Schwartz, and Schwartz dribbles a little bit. He passes a bounce pass back to you, and then there's that little thing. A little thing clicks in your head. You cannot describe what it is. It's a little thing says, shoot, man, go, shoot. You know that thing I'm saying? And you just, you, you dribble, and you let her go from about 30 feet out. And you just let that thing go. And instantly, inside your mind, you know you're hitting. You know, you know you're going to hit. Oh, what a great feeling. You see that ball go, guy goes up and tries to block it, but it's a long shot. You just see it arching down, arching, choo, that wonderful sound. You know that sound, whoosh, just choo, doesn't touch the rim. Choo, shepherd cans another one. Speaking of getting canned, this is WOR AM and FM New York. Hit the button in there, quite now. Hit it, hit it. Hard. How does a political columnist get the facts? C.L. Salzberger, who comments on foreign affairs for the New York Times, gives one explanation. When you are trying to find out what is going on, mm -hmm. see the leaders of the government, people like the foreign minister, the prime minister, as well as the leaders of the opposition and members of the general public. Of course, uh, one can't always see uh, the person one wants to see at the moment. One wants to see him, but the New York Times name tends to open more doors than I think would be the case. Can you imagine this guy as a little kid? And it gives you a slightly different access than you might otherwise have. <laughs> For easy access to more of everything that interests you every day, read the New York Times. If you're without it, you're not with it. For home delivery, call Murray Hill 7 0700. That's M-U-7-0700. You know, C.L. Salzberger, that's the, did you hear who you were listening to then? Or did you really listen to that commercial? That was C.L. Salzberger, who writes only on the editorial page of the Times. Have you ever read his prose? I'll tell you what his prose sounds like when you read it. It sounds like the ruins of Pompeii. <laughs> he writes, oh boy, talk about thick turgid leaden prose. I mean, it just comes pouring out. And it sounds like the, just the way he sounds, you know. When you're talking to a prime minister, when you're talking to a cabinet member, you want to know what's really going on. 
You know, Joe, wow, that's important, fantastic. You can never see El Salzburg. You can't imagine there was a little kid named Charlie. Hey, Chaz, come on out and play, Charlie. He is C.L. Salzberger at the age of three. Can you imagine Walter Lippmann, important guys like that? Can you imagine a guy standing out of his uh, outside of his house? Hey, Wally, you're scared to come out and fight. Come on out and fight, Wally. Oh, no. Walter Lippmann was never a kid. You don't think for a minute that Charles de Gaulle was ever a kid. And that somebody picked him up and he's, you know, he's four months old and he's wet. And somebody says, why don't you change him for him? You know, just never. You're just a, the, the important people just never. It's the rest of us. No wonder we feel so inadequate when we're faced with the Walter Lippmans and the CEO. Speaking of inadequacy, give us a little beer there. We had a beer. That's, that's the one thing that makes us go, man. Hit it there. I say, I say never beer is the elixir of the masses. Bring it in. Beer, <laughs> That's what makes it worth all while. All while. There's yeah. only one champagne of bottled beer. Sparkling. Flavorful. Uh. Distinctive. Miller Highlight. Cha-cha-da-da-da. Brewed from a century-old recipe, Miller High Life has a rich heritage and tradition. A bright, clear taste. Unequaled, unquestioned, unchanging. Available on tap, in cans, and in familiar crystal clear bottles. Miller High Life is always sparkling, flavorful, distinctive. Enjoy Miller High Life yourself. Yes, Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. You got to admit, I got a pretty good beat. You know, all on the subject of these important type guys like uh, Salzberger and Lippmann, you know, hearing that beer commercial, you, know, you play these commercials, and eventually, you know, I think I think we're just like uh, we're, we're we're part of such a fantastic sea of sound that none of us ever really think about this. It's a commercial for beer. It's a commercial for the time. It's just a commercial. You just let it go, and you don't really listen to it. But you know, one of one of the one of the one of the other little secret great moments in your life is, in particular, I don't know whether it's true of your life, but it's certainly true of my life. Is when you really, it's the right moment. You know what I mean by the right moment for a beer. There's the other most beer I can go for days, and beer means nothing to me. But you know, you're sitting back. Let's just take a, a typical example. You're sitting back at third base, and the sun is beaten down, and the Mets are trailing by nine. It's the second inning, and you're looking out. <laughs> you're looking out over that green. I don't know what it is. It's a funny thing. You're looking out over that green field. There's a lot of people all around you, and you got your t-shirt on. You're sweating it through. And this guy goes by with that white hat, and he's on a beer, 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 ice cold beer, 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 beer. ice cold beer. He says, hey, boy. And it, uh, just out of the, uh, all of a sudden it comes out, hey, I'll have a beer. And he says, how many do you want? You say, two. And uh, he looks at you, there's only one guy. You say, two. And uh, he hands you these two big cardboard, I think there's very few more beautiful ways to drink beer than out of those big cardboard containers you get at the ballpark. I don't know why. You know, they pour it up, the head comes up about three inches in them, and you sit there and you take that first big shot of beer. It's one of the things that makes it all worthwhile. Just one of those things. I would like, uh, can, can you imagine this great moment at the, at the Geneva Peace Conference or something? No, this is not commercial. You can put this on there. At the Geneva Peace Conference, they're all sitting around, and De Gaulle is over there, and President Johnson is sitting over here, and Mao Zedong is sitting on the other side, and they all sit there and they glare at each other for a minute. And all of a sudden, uh, Mao Zedong or De Gaulle or Johnson says, uh, before we start, how about a beer? Somehow I'd have a little faith that something would happen at that conference. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you got another one in there? Oh, we've got a couple of them here. Let's, let's do them here. We've got the Woolmouth here. Uh, let's see what they're saying here tonight. Oh boy, wouldn't it be nice to be able to afford measure? Made to measure clothes. I don't know. I think we can all afford that once in a while. You can start out by selecting the fabric. Then choose the style that's right for your height and weight. If you're pear-shaped, it, it doesn't make any difference. The tailor helps you select the proper custom features, the proper shaping of the jacket waist. If you want the silver lapels, the whole scene, they'll make it. 
shoulders, lapels, trouser taper, and so on. That's Woolmouth. And their prices start at $69.95 for a custom-made, customized, made-to-measure suit in your choice of over 1,500 fabrics. And by the way, some of those fabrics are unbelievable. You know that you can get a pair of barbed wire knickers if you want down there? Uh, if, if you really are desperate. Do you remember the stuff they used to call in the Army horse blanket? Do you ever have a pair of horse blanket pants that are made out of special stuff that they make Brillo pads out of? And it scrapes the skin off your knee. <laughs> You've had scratchy suits, man. I know you have. We've all had them, boy. I'll tell you, they're really crummy. <laughs> and you can get them at Walmart if you want. If you really are that type. But people buy scratchy suits, many people, because they got they got a troubled conscience. And there's nothing that keeps a man more on the stick than a scratchy suit. It makes you walk straight. That's at Woolmut. W-O-H-L-M-U-T-H. There's one store at 109 Asylum Street in Hartford and 523 Main Street in New Rochelle. One more final commercial, and that's the Rover 2000, which is a great English automobile. We have talked many times about it on the show. And uh, you're beginning to see more and more of them around. For good reason. It's one of the most advanced cars in the world. Yeah, have, do you, uh, you're from the islands, aren't you? Uh, you see British cars down there, don't you? Have you ever seen a Rover? That's a great car. And the one that is specifically uh, sponsoring the show is the 2000. You know it? That's their uh, sport car type. Boy, that's a nice machine. If you can afford it. <laughs> it ain't no cheapy. Uh, it's a great car. It's the Rover 2000, if you'd like a picture of it. And uh, I might point out, if you say to yourself, well, it can't be much of a car because I don't know about it. Forget it, Dad. Uh, this, is a, this is a company that does not do a great deal of advertising. Uh, it's a high-quality product. Uh, you don't see many Bentley ads either, for that matter. They are not on the Johnny Carson Show. Uh, this is the Rover 2000, and if you would like a picture of it, send your name and address to uh, Esoteric. Here at, <laughs> at WOR, that's the Rover 2000. All right, now, can we get back to real life here? All right, now we're back to real life. And, uh, I, you know, speaking of cars, I wanted, uh, I, and in connection with the judge that goes rushing out into his backyard with the number six iron, I'm thinking, uh, I, 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 I've had a lot of requests for people, from people to tell this story again. But it is a true story. And, uh, it has to do with this judge and the number six iron. And it's, it's, it also has to do with the backyards of life. The backyards of life. Have you ever driven up and down through, through, uh, places like, uh, Maine? You ever gone to Maine? You ever been through Vermont? Way out in the boondocks? I mean, way out, up in Maine, Vermont, places like that. One of the most American sites that I know of. And you don't see this in other countries. And it's because, I guess, we have this uh, machine society. We have, this, we have a Detroit society. We have an automobile society. That when you get out in the boondocks in places like Maine, places like Vermont, and Jersey, too, I suppose, in certain places, you look back at the house, you see weeds growing up, a fantastic collection of weeds, and you see this old crummy-looking garage and a couple of little hen... What do you keep looking at? What are you worried about? A couple of little hen houses and a couple of little joints laying back there. But... The, the, the significant thing that you see in this backyard is an old defeated car that's beginning to sink down into the mud. It's a deserted car. It's a thrown away automobile. A car that no longer is alive. It's a dead car. And, and some of these cars up in places like Maine, this is a curious thing about it, are late models. Have you seen this? You see, you see a car like a, like a 50, late, comparatively late. You'll see something like a, a 56 Oldsmobile or a, or a 61 Cadillac or something. And it's all, it's been, it's been deserted. It's been thrown away and it's drifting down into the mud. And you see it, you see the crud up to the ankles of, of it. And, the, and there's holes in the window and kids have been playing. The doors are hanging open. You see this in thousands and thousands of backyards throughout America. You know, I've traveled all over the world and I have never seen old cars in backyards of any other country. I have never seen an old car, say, in a backyard in France. I'm sure there are garages there. I've seen garages. But never old cars in just ordinary people's backyards. You may see an old wagon when you go way out in the country someplace. You may see an old, an old busted down 
buggy or something. They'd never see a car. In America, cars. And I can remember looking out of the window. I'm a little kid, see. And my Uncle Carl has this, this old Essex, and it's blue. And it's that ink blot blue. A kind of washed out blue, flat blue. It never was shiny. And he, I don't know where he got the car. Cause he never worked. Uncle Carl was out of work as long as I knew about Uncle Carl. He was perennially and totally a displaced person in the existence of life, you know, the whole scene. He just hung around, played his banjo, and once in a while took his teeth out, put them in a jar, and uh, he would always uh, take us to picnics in his Essex, and we'd go out to the forest preserves. But I remember that car drifting down and becoming not really totally derelict, because once in a great while, he would go out and he would start it, and he would drive around, maybe uh, go out to the forest preserve with it. And then it would spend days after day, after week after week in the backyard, and the rain would come down, and the snow would come down, and the sun would come down on this thing. And it had one of those tops. It was a sedan, you know. It was a, you know, it was a sedan, four-door type. But it had one of those tops that they used to have on cars that was like leatherette. You know, the top it was an insert. And they had things called top dressing. They were always painting tar and crud on the top of these cars. Well, along about the 423rd year of this car's life, part of the top had begun to peel back. And Uncle Carl would go out and once in a while he'd tack it down. Or we would lay a brick on the top of it. Or he would take tar off the street. You know, we had tar that was, uh, that was, uh, in the cracks of the street. He would dig up tar and melt it down in the basement and pour it on the top. <laughs> and then, uh, one by one, uh, day by day, uh, struggle by struggle, the top is getting thicker and fatter. It was like a compost heap. A little tax and pieces of paper and he'd stick cardboard in there. And I'll never forget the fantastic spring. The rain had been coming down for days and the Essex is standing out there in the backyard. They lived about three backyards away from us and uh, me and Schwartz and Bruder are out there throwing in a few uh, hook shots in the in the basket there. And the day that Uncle Carl's car sprouted mushrooms. Mushrooms grew out of the top of his car. And the, yeah, I don't know where the mushroom seeds came from. I guess they, from the air. You could see mushrooms growing right out of the side of the car, right out of the top. They're growing right out of the metal. Uh, sticking out of the, out of that old leather. Everything, it, 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 it had decayed and fermented now. And once in a while in the dark quiet of the night, you could hear it bubbling and hissing out there. It's fermenting. And you could see those mushrooms growing out. And Uncle Carl would go out and he'd take the mushrooms off. He'd brush it off. And, and, and you, have you ever seen on the side of old trees that fungus? That kind of big things that stick out, red looking things, those awful looking, sometimes they're terrible looking, they look like cancer or something. Well that, that kind of stuff is growing out of the top of his, 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 his Essex. And he'd go out and he'd chop it off and it would grow again immediately. Like within 30 seconds it would grow again. And, and I remember one day going down to the store, going down to the, down to the pony keg. They had a thing called a pony keg, right? Yeah, you they have these in the East. A pony keg is a little store that stands in the middle of a vacant lot in the Midwest and sells nothing but booze. That's all they do. They don't serve it. They just sell it. They're a little tiny store, and this guy's standing back there, and he's got cases of beer. He's got cases of of uh, soda. He's got cases of wine, all kinds of real crummy wine. I mean, like, you know, like 10 cents a gallon wine, that kind of stuff that, that you know, that just, wow, it just makes you sick thinking. It turns your teeth purple, you know, that kind of junk. And, and he goes down to the pony keg one day, and we're driving down the street. And and uh, I remember looking up at the top of the car. I'm a little kid. And uh, you could see the stains where this, uh, the, the roof has soaked down through it. And you could smell the mushrooms growing in there. And driving down the street with a car that had mushrooms growing out of the top on the way to the pony keg is a typical Midwestern scene. Not typical, really, but let's say symbolic Midwestern scene. And, and that judge charging out of his house, oh, give me my six iron. Part of the whole scene. Part of the whole, the whole schlemu. And, uh, <laughs> you know, speaking of, uh, speaking of junkyards and that smell of junkyards and that, uh, that, uh, the backyard life. I don't, I doubt whether anybody, I've never read it, maybe possibly Nelson Olgren might have written about this at one point. But I've not seen any American writer yet describe the tremendous 
sense of uh, adventure. Uh, it's more than adventure, really. A sense of the hunt. You ever go on hunting? And you know that feeling that oh, something's about to happen? It can be almost anything, something great. Or maybe you get skunked, nothing. But that sense of uh, gambling, and it's not really gambling. I don't know what it is. It's a kind of peculiar excitement that develops inside your gut when you're doing this. Uh, no one has described a Saturday morning visit to the junkyard looking for a part for a car. And one of the, this is probably as much as anything one of the forces that formed me. I, I can remember endless Saturday mornings spent in endless junkyards with Schwartz and Flick and Bruner, my Uncle Carl, just guys in the neighborhood looking for things, burrowing through thousands of defeated cars, gigantic piles of, of uh, generators. Oh, that's exciting. Uh, it, it's really as exciting. I remember, I remember I had this little car. See, I bought a car when I'm a kid. I'm about 16 years old. The first car I ever bought was a, was a car that I worked on for about a year, making it so it could go. And it was a little Ford. Great car. And, uh, I remember spending junkyard mornings looking for 616 tires. Now, they didn't have them piled up. If, if they were piled up, if, if they were in the front of the junkyard, all piled up, used tires, sign. That meant they were good ones. Those weren't the ones I was looking for. He had prices on those, see. <laughs> and, and I would go to I would go to Leo's junkyard, and I would say, uh, "Hey, Leo, I'm going to look for some tires." He said, "Okay, kid." And that meant that I could go back into the junkyard, and it would it stretched for acres. Fantastic collection of junk, and I would go back and look at all the wrecked cars piled up, sometimes ten, twelve high and crawl all over the top of them looking for a 616 tire that had been left on a wreck. And finally, after about three hours of looking, of course, you didn't really look seriously because you were just looking at all the great stuff. And you'd run across a car that had a great speedometer in it. And it's all wrecked. And you can see blood all over it. It's dried blood. And you can see where the back end is burned out. But there's a great speedometer in it. Or a great gas gauge. Or maybe... Uh, Maybe there's a great uh, gear shift lever, or uh, who knows what, you know, something, a great steering wheel, or, you know, a great wheel, just a, a, a spare wheel. And so you, you get very casual, so you go on from back, you say to Leo, hey, Leo, boy, you got nothing here today. No tires, forget it, Leo. And you, you pretend like you're walking out, so you start walking out of the place. Then you turn and say, hey, Leo, uh, you mind if I, uh, uh, you know, you got an old wreck back there, uh, it's got a got an old wreck speedometer. It's all busted up, and uh, I, I I thought I'd like to have the glass. The glass is okay, Leo. Do you, do you mind? Uh, how much? How much? How much for that wreck speedometer and the olds back there? And he looks, and of course his mind is immediately going, wreck speedometer, my foot. The only thing good on that car is that speedometer. This kid has spotted it. All right, how much can I yench out of him? You know, how much can I? <laughs> how much can I squeeze out of this kid? <laughs> you say, well, uh. You know, it's not. A, I can see. I can see the gears are shot, and it's it's, it's, a, it's shot. But I just want the glass. You know, maybe I'll use the pointer. And he says, uh, "Look, I ain't going to take it out for you." So, oh no, I'll take it out. I'll take it out. I got to. You know, I, you, you go to the junkyard. By the way, all completely equipped. You got screwdrivers. You got wrenches sticking out of your back pocket. You got a couple of socket wrenches. You got wire cutters. You got the whole scene. And so I say, oh, no, I'll take it out. I'll take it out. I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, how about, uh, he's waiting for an offer, see. Say, uh, I'll give you a quarter for it, Leo. I just want the glass. It's a pregnant poison. Are you out of your mind? Come on. That's a, that's a perfectly good spin. That's, that's the best phenomenon in the lot. Oh, come on, Leo. It's got the, uh, the gears are shot. He says, well, all right. Uh, 35 cents. Go ahead. If you, you gotta take it out yourself and I'm not guaranteeing nothing. And you say, oh boy, I hit the jackpot. And you go back there and you take this. Oh, you struggle. You cut your hand. The blood is pouring out of you. You put a band-aid on it. You run around. You struggle hour after hour taking this, 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 uh, speedometer out of the, out of the Oldsmobile. And you finally get it out. You hold it in the sunlight. And you could smell the paint on it. You know, you'd see where you strip the, strip the screws taking it out. And you say, well, I'll have that reboard. I'll take it down to, 
I'll take it out of Frank Paswinski. He'll reboard this thing. I'll put a tap screw in this thing. Oh, gee, was wow. Oh, wowie, wowie. And for the next two weeks, that's your project. Installing the old speedometer in your Ford. And you're cutting out the dashboard. You know the whole scene. You're getting the tap screw set. And you finally, you finally lay in the speedometer cable. And it fits. And you get that thing and you put the Vaseline, the grease in there. And she goes in. And you take it around the block. And it's going. <laughs> it's grinding. And the needle is just flipping up to five and down to zero. <laughs> oh, damn it. And then you take it out and you pull out that, you pull out that, that flexible cord again. Ah, oh, I see why. It's not in the, it's not in the slot. Then you put it back in. You cr- Oh, wowie, it works! Whee! That's up around 30, 30, 35, 40, 45 miles. It falls back to 10, 15, 20. Oh, man, the jackpot. And then you wait for next Saturday. Next Saturday, you're after the steering wheel. And you go all over the lot until finally you find, you find this wrecked Pontiac. And it's got this great red plastic steering wheel. Oh, man. And you casually go back to Leo and say, Hey, Leo. Uh, Leo, boy, you sure ain't got no batteries around here today, man. Oh, wow. She was... Hey, Leo, I was looking at that Pontiac back there, and uh, it's got a it's got a bracket for the steering column there. Uh, you're working up to it gradually, see? Uh, how about that bracket? How much is a bracket, Leo? He said, bracket is $2, man. Those are very rare, boy. They bust them all the time in a Pontiac. That's a $2 bracket, kid. So, wow, $2 bracket, you know, well, how about that crummy old rotten steering wheel that's on it? You know, that old steering wheel, you're probably going to throw it away. How much of that right? That means that that's what you're really after. He says, oh, that Pontiac, oh, that's a that's a new plastic kind with a pistol rim. Oh, well, that, uh, it's got a horn rim, you know. It's got the horn ring on it and everything. That'll be, uh, that'll be $3. $3? Oh, Leo, you're out of your mind. Listen, if I take it off myself... And it's going to take four days to get that crummy thing off. I got a hacksaw with me. If I take it off myself, how about a buck and a half? All right, make it a dollar sixty-five. Okay, kid, go. And for the next two weeks, you got the steering wheel thing going, putting your Pontiac steering wheel on your Ford. And then after that, oh, who knows? You know, it goes on and on and on. The biggest deal that I ever pulled, the biggest fantastic job I ever pulled. I put a Buick transmission. A Buick transmission out of the big century Buick. Believe it or not, you're looking at a guy who put a Buick transmission in a Ford V8, 65 horsepower mod. You're looking at a man who knows his junkyards, Dad. I've been there. Gene Shepard from March. Well, you better get on Whoa. a stick and... And a Hang on, you almost got an extra ending, but we have no time for that. Gene Shepard, March 9th, 1966, which wraps up today's show. Golden Age of Radio, Sundays, 7 to 9. Um, I have a few requests, like one hour suspense broadcast, so maybe we'll hear that this week. And don't forget my new show on the Internet. Yes, I was suckered into producing a program for Yesterday USA. That's where you go to hear it, yesterdayusa.com. It's Saturdays from 11 to 1 uh, in the morning. So uh, we have the Steve Allen interview, part two. We've got Fred Allen this week, as well as an episode of Gangbusters. So that's uh, yesterdayusa.com, 11 o'clock Saturday morning for the international edition of the Golden Age of Radio. This is Max Schmied. Thanks for listening. And just a little bit of an old hit to take us on out of here and bring us in to wake up call.